2005 to 2014, Progress in Ontario Towards Full Accessibility for People with Disabilities. David Lepofsky, Chair, Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act Alliance. Delivered at the Osgoode Hall Law School, February 3rd, 2014, as a Roy McMurtry Clinical Fellow. Good afternoon, everyone. In a series of lectures I'm giving during my month here at Osgoode Hall Law School, I'm, I'm trying to give the whole history, background, strategies, and results of a grassroots campaign that's gone on for many years in Ontario to tackle the barriers people with disabilities uh, face and to use the law to solve those barriers, to achieve our goal of a barrier-free society. What I'd like to do today is talk about our results. What have we accomplished? In 2005, the Ontario uh, Legislature unanimously passed and applauded the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, or AODA. I had the privilege of leading the decade-long nonpartisan fight to win us that legislation. It's now been nine years since it's passed. What did it guarantee and how are we doing? What have we accomplished? This is about results. So before I jump into the results, I gotta tell you a bit about the problems. This is covered elsewhere in some of the lectures in this series, but I'll do it briefly. We've got at least uh, 1.7 or 1.8 million people with a physical or mental or sensory uh, disability in Ontario right now. That number is growing as the population ages. When those folks try to get a job or an education or use transit services or go buy goods or services uh, from stores, uh, they face barriers every day of their lives. Some of them are physical. The building may be physically inaccessible. Some of them may be technological. Their website might be inaccessible to the adaptive technology that a blind person like me uses to read what's on a computer screen. Some of them may be bureaucratic, some may be attitudinal. They're all illegal. Since, 2000, pardon me, since 1982, they have violated the Ontario Human Rights Code, which guarantees um, equality for people with disabilities without discrimination in areas like employment, housing, goods, and services. Since, two th since 1985, in the case of public sector organizations, they violate the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, its Section 15 Guarantee of Equality. The problem with those laws that drew, drove many of us to fight for a Disabilities Act was not that they weren't, were, were poorly worded or that they were badly interpreted by courts, but rather that to enforce those laws, you had to bring uh, human rights or uh, charter claims one barrier at a time. Individuals had to be the cops, and they could run up against huge battles uh, if they took on that uh, uh, by, by uh, organizations that might be well-funded, well-oiled, and well-lawyered. And most people with disabilities don't have the time, the resources, uh, and the opportunity to wage those kind of battles. And even if they all did, we'd still, we face too many barriers to, to, to tear down that way. So our solution was a new law. So what did we win in 2005? The AODA is an important and groundbreaking law in uh, Ontario. And the legislature, the governing uh, liberals under then Dalton McGuinty and the opposition parties, which voted for, all voted for it, have much to be proud of for their unanimous support. The first thing it does is it requires Ontario to become fully accessible by 2025. It gave 20 years. Next, it requires the Ontario government to lead us there. Not to pay for it, but to lead us there. And it does so by two major roles. The government is required to develop and enact a series of accessibility standards. An accessibility standard is a regulation or a law that speaks to a particular sector of the economy or a particular area of human activity. And it says, hey folks, you in that sector, you've got to tear down these barriers, you've got to prevent these barriers, and here, what, here's what you've got to do, and here's when you've got to do it by. So they provide clear, they're supposed to provide clear direction. And the AODA doesn't just let the government make these standards, it requires the government to do so and to enact them, enough of them to ensure that we get to the goal of full accessibility. The second thing that the AODA requires is that the government effectively enforce these standards and it gives the government enforcement powers. Now in other lectures in this series, I talk about the fight to get this legislation, the design of the legislation, how accessibility standards are actually made. 
Today I'm just jumping to results. But as I address results, I, results, I have to paint a kind of a concept or a picture in your mind to bear in mind. If, if you were the victim of an individual act of discrimination, I was when the Toronto Transit Commission refused to consistently announce all subway or bus stops for the benefit of blind people like me. You had to bring an individual case and if the case went to full litigation, there's the opportunity to sit down with the organization on the other side and, and negotiate a resolution. Now in those two cases, we weren't able to settle them, I had to go to a full hearing, but many if not most human rights uh, claims get settled. Think of the standards development process. The development of an accessibility standard is like creating one huge negotiating table to settle a bunch of human rights complaints. So if you do a transportation standard, it provides an opportunity for one, the disability community's representatives on one side of the table and the transportation sector on the other side of the table to work out what are the barriers, what are the problems, what kind of fixes can we do, make recommendations to government, and then the government can decide what to do. And the advantage of this format is that if they come up with good measures, that's great. But if the measures they come up with are too weak and don't meet the stringent requirements of accessibility in the Human Rights Code and the Charter of Rights, it always remains open to an individual to bring a human rights or charter case to enforce their rights to say those standards under the AODA aren't good enough. And that was part of our design. We didn't want the government in enacting an accessibility standard to be able to reduce our rights. And the Disabilities Act specifically says, if another law provides more accessibility, that's the law that prevails. So how'd we do? The conclusion I'm gonna take you to is that we've made, I believe, uh, progress since 2005 that we would not have made without the Disabilities Act. So this has been a fruitful and a worthwhile venture but we are certainly way behind schedule in achieving full accessibility by 2025. We are not where we should be nine years into this. And unless something changes dramatically, we will not reach full accessibility by 2025 or ever. The lecture I'm gonna to give tomorrow at York Lanes will, go, will review strategies that we are undertaking now to try to kickstart this process to get govern, the government of Ontario back on schedule where it should be. But we are, so on the one hand, the good news is this has been worth pressing because we've made, we're creating more activity to remove and prevent barriers against people with disabilities than, than uh, we would have if we just left it to individuals to litigate them and didn't have the AODA. But the AODA has not lived up to its promise anywhere near it. So, to the results. The first thing I need to focus on is where the government started. In 2005, the government decided that the, it would make five accessibility standards first. We thought the choices were good. One was in the area of customer service. Second was in the area of transportation. Third in the area of employment. Fourth in the area of information communication. And fifth in the area of the built environment. Let me tell you what we've gained so far. They were all good choices. They don't cover the whole waterfront. We need more standards now. But at least as the first five to tackle, they were a good choice. First, the customer service accessibility standard. It was the first to be enacted. It was passed in 2007. It is limited in scope. The idea of an accessibility standard was that it would list barriers you've got to remove or prevent and tell you when you've got to do it by. For the most part, this standard, only eight pages long, didn't. It tells organizations that provide goods or services to the public that they must develop an accessibility policy, that they've got to train their employees on it, that they've got to have a customer feedback system for people to file complaints if things aren't going well. Now those are useful things to do, but we wanted a standard that actually told those who provide goods and services not just have a policy, but here are the barriers you should be fixing or preventing. So it served as an icebreaker, that's good. Got organizations talking about accessibility, that's good, if they deliver uh, uh, goods or services. But on the other hand, it did actually motivate some organizations to actually do what they're told. Um, and it did lead some organizations to go even beyond what the specific standard requires. That's all good. But the three major flaws with it, the first I've already identified, <clears throat> 
is that it did not actually specify the range of barriers it should have so that organizations would know exactly what they've got to do. The whole idea of standards is so that each organization doesn't have to reinvent the wheel and so that we folk, folks with disabilities know what we are entitled to get. The second flaw oh, is that the standard, and this applies with all of the standards uh, with only a couple exceptions in them, had crazy long timelines. They gave the public sector, government, school boards, and cities, and so on, universities, till 2010, just to come up with a policy that they could have devised within a few weeks, trained their staff in in a few weeks, and uh, set up a feedback me mechanism. They got three years. Even more crazy, they gave the private sector up till 20, the end of 2012 which is way too long, way too close to the end of the 20-year uh, uh, her event horizon for this legislation. The final problem with the customer service standard is it actually, and we would say wrongly and impermissibly, purported to authorize the creation of a barrier. It provides that an organization that provides goods or services can decide that you, with a disability, are essentially a danger to yourself or others if you come into their, their uh, place of business alone and to require you to bring a support person and to be also free to charge a second fee or admission fee if there is one for that support person. We say that shouldn't have been there in the first place, that the accessibility standards are there to get rid of barriers, not authorize or create them. Nevertheless, it was an icebreaker. It was the, the start. What about the other areas? Well, three of the areas I've listed uh, that they dealt with, transportation, uh, employment and information communications were all regulated in June of 2011. A single regulation was passed, it's called the Integrated Accessibility Standard Regulation, to address all three of those areas. Let me tell you what we've gained. I'm summarizing, there's a lot more detail uh, in them, more than I can cover in the time of this, of this lecture. First, before it delves into the specifics of either any of those three important areas of, of activity, it sets some important general requirements. Any organization that provides transportation or has employees um, or that uh, could need or provide information communication or use those, they've got to, number one, create an accessibility policy to deal both with the requirements of, the, of this regulation and generally to get to full accessibility. Second, they've got to develop, um, in the case particularly of larger organizations, an accessibility plan. And it's got to have detail on how they're going to implement their policy. It's also uh, got to be implemented. It's not enough to just have a plan. They've got to implement their plan. And finally, after a certain amount of time, those plans are multi-year plans, like five-year plans, but every year after they establish that plan for large organizations, they've got to, excuse me, develop and make available on, um, to the public an annual status report. How are they doing? Now, these three measures together force an organization, in effect, to look at their accessibility problems or issues within their organizations. And that's really important because when we present, bar or we identify barriers, a person with disability goes to a, a government office or a private office or whatever and says, hey, there, I, I can't work here or I can't benefit from, from the services you provide. I'm facing a barrier. The common answer we got, we get is, oh, we never thought of that. And requiring organizations to have a policy, have a plan, do status reports and implement their plan, in a sense, says, Think about it, and it targets one of the inherent problems that leads to the barriers we face. So all of that's good. There are some more general requirements, organizations within certain uh, government, and uh, uh, particularly have to make sure that when they use public money to buy goods and services that they take into account accessibility, so they buy things that uh, we can use. When they set up electronic kiosks for us to, to uh, access services, um, they should be, uh, include accessibility features too. These are all steps forward. These, like other requirements in the standard, have exceptions that we think are too broad, but they, that 
concern is tempered by the fact that the human rights code still prevails. And an organization, we always caution, that thinks that they can rely on the uh, broad exceptions in these regulations is taking a huge risk because they may not, they may think that they're complying with the AODA standard, but they're not necessarily complying with the requirements of the human rights code. Any organization that's gonna to try to do work in these, this area of accessibility is gonna to wanna to do what they need to do to make sure they're on the right side of the law. And to the extent these standards fall short of the human rights code, and believe me, they do. We think they're a missed opportunity. Helpful, but a missed opportunity. And they generate the risk that an organization may say, hey, wait a minute, I thought I complied with that standard. I did all I gotta do. What do you mean I now face a human rights complaint? And an organization that is that frustrated is entitled to be that frustrated. Um, we'd like to see the standard strengthened, or at least that organizations be warned of how far they've got to go to comply with the Human Rights Code, not just these standards. Anyway, let me now go past these general provisions to tackle the three specific areas uh, that the Integrated stand Accessibility Standard of, of 20, uh, 2011 uh, touches. First, it regulates transportation. This is huge for people with disabilities. I gave an entire lecture on this subject uh, which will be available on video as part of this lecture series. So I'm only gonna now touch on a couple of high points. The transportation provisions help by delineating uh, requirements for accessible public transit vehicles and requirements for parallel transit. In Toronto it's called wheel trans for those who can't ride the conventional system. But it's got a number of major, major flaws. First, this part of the standard, like most, if not all, of the standards the government passed really owns, only aims at preventing new barriers. Now, preventing new barriers is important. Making sure that public transit authorities only buy accessible vehicles to be used by the public, that's important and that's good. But what about all the inaccessible vehicles that they're going to have on the road for the next 20 years till they wear out? The standard purports to say that they don't need to be retrofitted. Uh, generally, with a couple of very narrow exceptions. Well, if the retrofit could be done at reasonable cost and could provide real accessibility, that's wrong. Maybe not for the vehicle that's going to go out of service next week, but the one that was bought 20 minutes before the standard went into effect, we shouldn't have to wait the 20 years or whatever that that vehicle wears out. Moreover, the standard actually authorized organizations uh, transit authorities to keep buying inaccessible vehicles, all contracting for them all the way up to July of 2011. Even though the transit sector knew these standards were coming, were at the table when they were being negotiated, had a lot of input into what they say. That's just wrong. It also violates, in our view, Supreme Court of Canada case law about the not duty not to create new barriers. Finally, or second, the transportation standard does not address accessibility in public transit stations, union stations, subway stations, and so on. And there are a number of barriers there that are pretty important. Accessible vehicles aren't very useful if you can't get on them, or if you get off them in a station, but you can't get out of the station. Finally, the standard um, deals with a couple of areas that are important, like accessible taxis, accessible bus stops at, at the roadside, not by saying all of what needs to be done and by when, but simply by leaving it to cities to decide what needs to be done and when as they regulate trans uh, taxis or decide what to do with their bus stops. The problem with that is it means we've got to have every city reinvent the wheel, make a lot of mistakes, and we've got to now lobby city by city rather than one provincial government. Defeats the purpose that the Disabilities Act was passed for in the first place. Let me turn to the area of information and communications. This is a hugely important area, and it's probably the area where we've made some of our greatest strides. Think about it. When you go to work, or to school, or to buy goods or services, or engage in any kind of commerce, communication is at the core of it. Reading what's on their website, reading materials that they make available for you to to read if it's option, manuals, catalogs, reading materials at school, talking to people, talking to the person over the counter about what they're selling or about what you wanna buy, knowing what your professor is actually, or teacher is saying in school and so on. For people with communication disabilities, 
or information disabilities, these are huge, the barriers to accessible information communication are enormous and are a huge impediment to full participation. Um, I think it's to the government's credit that, that they did tackle information communications as part of the 2011 integrated regulation, accessibility regulation, and there are a number of good components in it. These are subject to our general criticism that the timelines are way too long and the exemptions are way too broad. But I'll just summarize some of what's in there. First, they require organizations uh, it, that provide goods or services to provide information supports. For a blind person, that might mean, mean access to information in audio recorded or um, in braille um, or um, in a large print if they're low vision. Similar for people with dyslexia, they may need it um, in an electronic version that their computer can read aloud. Um, for people with hearing loss, um, there's alternative kinds of communication that work for them. Some use sign language, some use lip reading, some use captioning. There's a range of different needs. The regulation doesn't detail exactly what you give and when to give it, but it does set up a framework for requesting these kinds of accommodations um, and, and supports. And that um, is a real step forward. Perhaps the most um, specific step forward in this regulation in the area of information communication relates to website accessibility. Now if you're sighted, you're used to, and not dyslexic, you're used to just going on your computer, logging on a website, and using it, point and click and so on. If you've got a mobility disability, if you can't use your hands, you may have problems using a mouse. Um, and there is access technology to conquer all this. But for those of us with print disabilities, with visual reading disabilities, whether visual impairment or dyslexia, and other disabilities, there are ways to format a website that makes it easier for our computers using our screen reading access technology to access. And if they, if, if they use those design techniques in the architecture of their website, that actually enables us to fully uh, uh, use them and in fact opens through the internet an entire world of information accessible without needing anyone's help that was never available to me 35 years ago when I went to this law school. The revolution in access to printed information for people with vision loss since I was a kid is breathtaking. I would compare it to the difference between taking a horse and buggy to go from Toronto to Florida to taking an airplane to go from Toronto to Florida. It is absolutely transformative. However, if when a website is designed, the right architecture is not included, which is easy to include, to ensure that our screen access technology can access it, um, we don't get the benefit of those websites, we don't get the benefit of that transformative change, instead we find that yet another accessibility door has been slammed in our face. Now, what did the government uh, do here? By the way, the changes in a website, or the architectural features in a website that make it more accessible to us, uh, also make it easier to use for everybody, and especially those using smartphones. So this isn't a question of what do we require them to do that uh, benefits us and, and at the price of everyone else. It actually benefits everyone the same way that when the TTC calls root stops for the benefit of a blind person like me, it also helps sighted folks. Same way a, a ramp instead of steps in front of a building helps people with a baby stroller, a shopping cart, a bag on wheels, or a wheelchair or walker. Well, what the government did is uh, they relied on and they accepted our position that they should require over time that websites conform with an international standard that's been set for web accessibility. The fancy letters are WCAG, or World uh, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.0. These were developed some years ago. They have three different layers, levels, single A, double A, and triple A. Triple A is not meant as a regulatory uh, lever. We want a double A. The government has regulated, required itself to achieve double A over timelines we say are too long, but at least it set them. It, for other organizations, they say single A, rising to double A. This is foolish because what they're really telling people is re-engineer your practices once to meet an inadequate lower single A standard, and then later go back and learn all over again to start meeting a more useful double A standard. And they set timelines for them that are so long that uh, 
I think that by the time the last of them kicks in, there'll be a WCAG 3.0, and this will all be moot. Um, it'll be superseded. Uh, but in any event, it is a step forward. I think any organization that's smart is going to go to AA right now, ahead of the timelines. Why bother running the risk of being sued? It's happened in the States. Target Corporation was sued for inaccessible websites successfully. Um, and it's happened in Canada. A blind woman named Donna Jodhan successfully sued the Canadian government for website inaccessibility. The federal government was, was given 18 months to fix their uh, websites. Now, the government exempted some technical standards for uh, a number of years. I, I don't want to go into the details. I can answer questions on it. But all in all, this is a significant step forward. Finally, in the area of information communications, the standard does set requirements for educational institutions, like this one. It requires that when they get provide books, like you read, um, for courses, they should be trying to acquire them from suppliers who can also have ones that can be provided to students uh, with, with print disabilities in an accessible format. Since books are now no longer written by pen or on a typewriter, they're written on computer, probably in a program like Microsoft Word, the uh, publisher at some point has the document in a format like Word that we could readily read with the right access technology. If you have an iPhone, by the way, um, you can buy one app for 10 bucks uh, that I use every day, upload any Word document at tap, and your iPhone is reading it to you, or your iPad. I mean, this is, we're not talking about expensive access technology. But if the formats are, inex are, are problematic formats, uh, we can't read them. So the idea of universities having to aim to procure uh, uh, materials for use in courses that we can actually get access to quickly would overcome barriers that I faced when I was a student here at an undergrad and in high school and that uh, students with disabilities, uh, print with disabilities, continued to face over many years since then. It also requires publishers uh, that sell books to institutions like this um, to make product available with an accessible format option. And that's a significant breakthrough. And finally, it requires any educational organization like this to train their, the people who teach you on how to teach in an accessible way. That's a breakthrough. There are requirements about libraries procuring accessible product. Um, there's a lot of accessible product that they can procure. We think the requirements and the standards should have gone further. Let me turn to employment. Employment is, of course, fundamental, as is, are all the areas that these standards tackle. What we wanted was a standard that would describe to the employer of today what to do to make sure that their workplace five years from now is a fully accessible one. Five years, you could say six years, whichever. The fact is that the workplace of five years from now has not been designed. For a lot of organizations, they don't know what building they'll be in, and frankly, a lot of people don't work on site anyway. The technology, the software, the processes that they will use in five years in many cases have not been acquired yet, they've not been purchased yet, they've not been contracted for yet, they've not even been designed yet. So if employers set about today on an aggressive strategy to make sure that the workplace of five years from now would be barrier-free for people with disabilities, they could accomplish a great deal by planning ahead and at very marginal cost in most cases. The standard, for the most part, doesn't do that. It does require all organizations in their accessibility plans to detail what they're going to do to implement the standard and to remove and prevent barriers. And that, we believe, is general language that should require the kind of planning we're talking about. But the standard would have been way more effective if it then went into detail. Each employer shouldn't have to go out and figure out themselves what they need to do to reach that goal five or six years from now. It would have been much better if the standard did it for them. Instead, what the standard does, and it's helpful, is it takes something the law already requires and tries to make it actually happen. There are two ways to achieve accessibility in a, in a place of employment or a school or anywhere else. One is plan for an inclusive environment. Plan for a workplace that's barrier-free. That'll get you a good chunk of the way. 
But the other thing that will invariably happen is you'll have an employee or some employees with disabilities who no matter what your, your arrangements are, they may need an individual accommodation. And the Human Rights Code provides a duty to accommodate employees with disabilities up to the point of undue hardship on the part of the employer. So the standard doesn't touch that duty, it doesn't change that duty, nor should it or would it or could it. But what it does do is it tries to get employers to actually live up to that duty. It takes a bunch of practices which make frankly good sense, and I gather a number of large organizations are to use, and it sets it as a requirement for all but smaller organizations. It requires throughout the employment life cycle, interviewing, recruitment, hiring, training, promotion, and uh, if you go off work on disability, return to work, and your evaluation. It specifically says the, that the employer has to have a plan that they work out with you, the employee with a disability, on meeting your accommodation needs, and that you've got to make sure they know about the availability of these kind of supports. In a province where too many employees don't know what they're entitled to and not enough employers know what they're obliged to do, this can cause a lot of success, I believe. It will not completely solve the problem. To completely solve the problem, we need employers effectively planning for that barrier-free workplace of the future. By the way, if you're even spending a moment thinking about, well, what does this cost? The fact is, by planning for the future, you build it into the cost of running your business. And by achieving full accessibility, you open up the workplace to a greater pool of employees and as our population ages, a much greater pool of employees. So in effect, this is a money maker for any organization that seeks profit, we believe. Moreover, removing workplace barriers also helps ensure that the organization will have a barrier-free environment for customers with disabilities. So it's a win-win for an employer if they can hire, have access to a broader labor, labor pool and a broader customer base certainly worth the money. That's employment. So those are the three areas that were regulated in 2011. Let me turn now to the final area that the government said that they would regulate and that at least in one posting they claim they've finished regulating and we disagree. And that is the area of the built environment. Physical buildings indoors and outdoors. You don't have to spend much time trying to make your way around uh, our community before you find out that we have a community full of barriers. In government, in public sector settings like schools, in public transit, and in private settings, uh, businesses, and so on. These barriers hurt everyone. They help no one. And if you look at the legislative history of the AODA back between 2004 and 2005, as all three political parties uh, got on their feet to support the AODA, and in some cases urged that it even be strengthened, many references were made to the need to fix our built environment. And when the government proposed 20 years for implement achieving full accessibility, it's because principally they thought that the built environment was going to be one of the toughest nuts to crack. And the hypothesis underlying, or the hypothesis, the policy underlying the AODA, if barriers are easy to remove, do it fast. If it costs or takes more effort, costs more or takes more effort, take longer. But 20 years was viewed unanimously to be enough. So how are we doing? The government decided a built environment accessibility standard is needed, and they set about developing it. That's good. Where we got to is substantially incomplete. The government split the end product into two pieces. They decided to deal with inside the building by regulating it under the building code. The building code is a law that stipulates what buildings, what requirements you have when you build buildings, with a few exceptions. They decided to create a second or separate standard under the AODA to deal with what they call public spaces, things the building code doesn't, code doesn't regulate. Uh, recreational paths, parking spots, uh, and the like. 
Let me tell you where we've gotten so far. For one thing, the government decided when they embarked on this back in uh, 2008 or so, uh, they decided that the first round of regulatory effort would only deal with new construction or substantial renovations. See, the building code doesn't require you, for example, to go back and retrofit anything unless you're doing a re major renovation. And then only in the area you're doing the major renovation. Well, most buildings in Ontario are old and aren't going away and aren't being renovated. So the government decided to do that first and ipso facto decided that they were going to leave most built environments uh, uh, barriers untouched. The government's answer is, okay, we're going to do that first so we set the benchmark of what new construction should look like, and then after that, we will come back and through the standards development process, deal with the issue of retrofits, of fixing buildings which are not now under renovation and are not going to be renovated uh, in the, for, you know, for the time being. That's what they said. They have since passed a public, sec uh, uh, a public spaces accessibility regulation to deal with outside the buildings. And at the end of last year, at the end of December of 2013, they passed amendments to the building code to deal with inside the building. Let me tell you what we got, and let me tell you why it's inadequate so far. Helpful steps forward, but again, lost opportunities, and certainly not enough to get us to a fully accessible, barrier-free um, uh, built environment in 2025, or indeed ever. First, the public spaces regulation. It deals with a range of areas, beach, uh, recreational trails and beach access uh, routes. It sets some good technical standards about making sure they're accessible. By the way, everything that they're doing for people with mobility disabilities, if you're a hiker, you can say that's just a whole lot less tripping for me and stumbling and falling and hurting myself, um, uh, which is good. Um, it's going to be not. It's going to be helpful not only for people who have explicit mobility uh, disabilities. It'll be helpful for seniors who want to go for a walk and just can't go that far and for whom these supports will, uh, will be helpful. Um, but they are limited by a number of unreasonable limitations. They take way too long to go into effect. You've heard me sing that song. They are only applied to a trail or a beach access route that the organization creating them intends to maintain. Now, superficially, that means all an organization has to do is say, I built it, here it is, I hope people enjoy it, I have no intention of ever maintaining it. And they're off the hook. Our answer is, that wording um, is, uh, should not be read that way, and it should be read narrowly, so that it must require a demonstrated ongoing commitment in unequivocally to never maintain it at all. So as long as there's some chance they're going to do any maintaining ever, that exemption should not uh, come to the assistance of an organization. And any organization that thinks they're going to rely on that exemption is running a big risk. Moreover, their inaction could trigger a human rights complaint whether or not it constitutes a contravention of the public spaces accessibility regulation under the AODA. The second problem, and this recurs, is the government created these huge exemptions for these, for, for anything that, I'm going to paraphrase, might adversely affect certain natural environment considerations or heritage properties uh, and so on. And these exemptions are way wider than the undue hardship requirement of the Human Rights Code. There is no justification for saying we are going to make this, we can't make this trail accessible because it might adversely affect heritage. There's always, they've made the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, it's only, what, 2,000 years old? They've made that accessible. The Parthenon in Greece. The Osgood Hall, the other Osgood Hall, the one downtown, going a little closer to contemporary, built in the, whatever, 1850s, used to have steps at the front. They put a ramp in. It's different than the steps, but it works. And everybody likes it, especially, I might add, lawyers with law books in bookcases on wheels which of course is every, most of who's going in and out of that building. So these exemptions were, were included in terms that are way too broad and we feel any organization that thinks they're gonna rely on them is doing so at their peril. 
The, um, nevertheless, assuming organizations don't try to hide from those kind of uh, requirements, th this standard, unlike the customer service standard, unlike the employment standard, sets some detailed, specific technical requirements. How wide the path, angles, what you should have at the edges so people don't fall off or hurt themselves, when and where railings, and so on. And all of that is actually quite useful. The public spaces regulation then goes on uh, to deal with certain other public spaces. Um, for sidewalks, only new ones or redeveloped ones, it provides requirements for accessible curb cuts. Those are the, where, where we don't have a step down at the edge so that uh, people with mobility devices like wheelchairs and walkers can get down to the street. But for blind folks like me, a curb cut that just ramps down to the street is actually dangerous. Because our cane doesn't warn us, hey, you've left the sidewalk, enjoy those cars coming at you. So there is a solution, and the standard actually sets it, and this is groundbreaking, and this is good. They require at those edges what are called tactile walking surface indicators. It's a bumpy surface that our cane can detect, or if you're using a guide dog, your feet can detect, which help you know that you're in a, you've just changed from the sidewalk uh, to the street. Uh, we wish there was a requirement for retrofits at major uh, intersections, but at least for new ones, uh, that will be helpful. The public spaces standard also requires, um, everything in this is like good news on the one hand and bad on the other. It requires that new traffic lights or redeveloped traffic lights, I don't know who redevelops a traffic light or renovates them, but name it. They have to include what's called an audible pedestrian signal. You may have seen or heard these in some intersections. Where, um, where it beeps uh, when, you, when the light changes, so someone who can't see the light changing can know it's changing. This is good. The problem is it allows them, it gives the, uh, the option to a municipality to not have it run automatically, to require an individual with vision loss to walk over and have to grope and find a button and push it to trigger it. I will tell you that there are a number of uh, automatic or uh, uh, audible pedestrian signals in Toronto that have that feature. I have tried using them. It is a royal pain. I pretty much don't bother. If I've got a white cane in one hand, a briefcase in the other, gloves because it is Canada and it gets cold out, and I want to get home, going over and trying to find the pole, they have a beep coming from it, but it's not always audible over traffic signals, and then find the button and then press it and then wait it for it to run a couple of traffic, or a traffic cycle. There are other ways I'd, I rely on my earlier training uh, on how to cross streets without the benefit of them. This worries me because I don't want municipalities, and we don't want municipalities, to go install these and then say, we put all this money into them and no one's using them. The solution is to make them operate automatically, not with a push button, especially in non-residential areas. Some people say they make too much noise. There are white noise versions of them that are quite audible, but don't have to be um, as intrusive. Go to Australia, there are tons of these out there, uh, not just at major intersections. Another example of a good step forward at the same time as, to some extent, a lost opportunity. With respect to public spaces, um, I will tell you they also uh, cover things like accessible parking for parking lots and on the street. For parking lots, they set actual specific requirements, proportions or ratios and so on, uh, but for, for city parking, they just say, hey, city, you figure it out, uh, which we, do, we think, again, requires us to go lobbying city by city. Accessible playgrounds. If you're going to build a new playground, it says include accessibility features and consult with people with disabilities on them. It's helpful, but it would have been way more helpful if it said, here are the features to include, rather than leaving it to everybody, any municipality building a playground, or a private school or whatever, to have to incur the cost and the burden of going out and figuring out uh, uh, what, how to invent that wheel that others have already invented um, with, uh, in the past. Um, there are other public spaces requirements. They're similar in the sense that they, they target things we need to fix, uh, but they don't have enough detail quite often. And I think that what was going on is the government at certain points was getting chicken that if they got too specific, 
that uh, organizations, the public private sector might get upset, that why are you telling us all what to do? The fact is, in my experience, they want to know what they got to do so that they've complied with the law. In one case, they say in public in service areas, that's where you go to a, an office, they have a counter and they have a queuing line, that the queuing line has to be properly designed to be accessible and they should have at least one low counter. That's great, but they don't say how, the, how tall the counter should be. And an organization is left then to guess how tall they got to make it so that they don't get exposed to contravention of the law. Just misses the point of what a good and effective accessibility standard would do. It's helpful they regulated it, they should have gone further. Let me turn very briefly to the issue of inside buildings. Just last December, as I said, the government's passed some amendments to the building code. And they are helpful. Again, they don't go far enough. But there are several problems here. The first is, I have to say, the building code's been a problem for us for a long time. Since 1975, it's purported to set accessibility requirements, and it's always been incomplete and out of date. It was so incomplete and out of date that we needed the AODA passed so we could get this issue away from the building code people and back in the hands of people who might actually come up with solutions that meet our needs. So what happened? After the government got proposals from a, a, a built environment standards develop, development committee that was convened to put forward ideas, they took the part that could be dealt with by the building code and gave it back to the people who do, in the Ontario government, who deal with the building code. So it went right back to where the problem came from. It then languished there for years. Years. And what they ended up coming up with, while helpful, was always constrained by things like, oh, we can't do that because the building code doesn't let us. That might be good policy, but we can't do that because the building code doesn't let us. They come up with standards which, in the end, don't fulfill the human rights code. Uh, don't meet, rise to its requirements. And again, a lot of builders think, like others, that all they got to do is comply with the building code. They don't know from the human rights code. What we have said to the government is this. We don't mind if you've amended the building code, but you've got to keep your commitment to go further and you've got to pass a, an accessibility standard to deal with future retrofits in non-renovated old buildings. And to this day, the government has never said yes. They put a commitment to do that on their website in 09. We copied it under our website. They've since taken down that page of their website. But we have preserved it. You can't just take a page down and think the promise is going to go away. That's what we're there for, to hold them accountable. But the other thing we've asked them to do is this. We're entitled under the AODA to standards enacted under the AODA. And there's a bunch of procedural protections I deal with in other lectures and a bunch of safeguards for the disability community. We don't have those in the case of the building code. We've asked the government to take whatever they put in the building code and enact a parallel standard under the AODA for the built environment. It can regulate the exact same things in exactly the same way, but so that we have access to the whole machinery of the AODA to enforce it and to have it reviewed uh, with our entitlements for input. The government has an answer. So let me take the last few minutes to, so, so that's where we are. So if all these standards that are on the books were complied with to the letter, we would not achieve full accessibility by 2025 or ever. But on the other hand, they will help. And they certainly move us considerably further forward than we would have been if we had not uh, got, uh, uh, had this act uh, at all. Let me take the last few minutes to talk to you about uh, where we've come on other important fronts in achieving the goal of full accessibility by 2025, apart from the actual making of accessibility standards. Well, the first thing that will come to mind is, okay, that's great, they've made these standards. What about enforcing them? In the act, the government gave itself uh, effective enforcement powers, and we have repeated written promises on our website at aodaalliance.org um, that they would effectively enforce it. They can audit organizations, they can inspect organizations, they can issue compliance organizations, and there's uh, authority for very stiff monetary uh, penalties for contraventions. Well, enforcement, unfortunately, is not, has not been happening up to last fall. We actually wrote the government a year ago, a year ago, and said, can you tell us what you're doing about enforcing this law? Under that customer service standard, the one with the not very onerous requirements that gave business like five years to comply, 
All businesses with 20 or more employees had to file or e-file a self-report with the government by uh, the end of December of 2013. And all they had to do in that is say, you know, I've got a policy on a customer service, I've trained my staff, and I've done the other measures needed. A self-report. We're not talking about an income tax return. We're talking about a very simple self-report. We asked the government a year ago, how many of those organizations did file? And what are you doing about the ones who didn't? The government did not answer. We ran a count up on Twitter for months on their failure to answer. Last summer, I had to resort to a freedom of information request, and I finally got the answers last November, and they ended up on uh, prominent coverage in the Toronto Star and in an editorial in the Toronto Star because the news was so bad. What did we find out? Of the 36 or so, uh, or pardon me, of all the private sector organizations in Ontario that had to file one of those reports, they had five years to do it, um, uh, by, of all those with 20 or more employees, by the end of last year, by the end of, or by the middle of this past November, even eight or 10 months after the deadline, fully 70% were in violation of that filing requirement. And the government knew it. It was higher a year ago. It had gone up to just un to 70% of, non or I should say down, to 70% noncompliance. That is pathetic. And the government knew it. So the question is, what were they doing about enforcing it? Well, we revealed through our Freedom of Information request that the government had not issued a single monetary penalty, they'd not issued a single compliance order, they'd not conducted a single inspection or a single audit of any of those organizations, even though they knew for months about this rampant non-contravention, and even though they withheld the information from us and forced us to resort to a freedom of information request to get it. Well, you might wonder, well, is it a problem that the budget's really bad, they just don't have the money for the enforcement? So I asked, how much the gov government annually gave to the office that had this mandate, it's called the Accessibility Director of Ontario, and how much they actually used. Because you'd think, oh, they must be over budget, they just don't have the time. Turned out, they're under budget every year, sometimes in excess of a million bucks a year. From 05 to 2013, they had not used a total of $24 million appropriated to them over the, I don't mean in one year, but I'm spread over the whole period. So they weren't enforcing, they knew of rampant contraventions, they had the money to do it, they had the power to do it, they just weren't doing it. And they promised effective enforcement with the lead minister responsible, Dr. Eric Hoskins, had months earlier said that this act, accessibility, is his top, and his government's top priority. Heck of a top priority. So that's where we're at on enforcement. Needless to say, we've been uh, working hard on that one. Um, there are other areas where we are uh, undertaking advocacy. I'm going to do very, very, very quick uh, bullets because they, they're part of the campaign to try to get full accessibility. Um, we are concerned that Ontario laws not either authorize or require discrimination or, or create or perpetuate barriers. So in 2007, we asked the government to undertake a review of all its legislation to, re to uh, identify um, accessibility problems. Um, the Premier in 07, Dalton McGuinty, promised it. They didn't start till around 2011. It's going on now. Again, too slow, but it's an interesting area of trying to affect social change, not through uh, challenging laws in court, but ch trying to get the, the government to look at its own legislation and figure out what it should be doing. Another area in which we've been active is trying to use the public purse. The government spends billions every year on capital infrastructure, not just government buildings, but giving money to colleges and universities and hospitals and so on, and municipalities for buildings. And it also spends billions every year buying goods and services. We wanted the government to make it a condition of anyone getting that money that they not use a dime of public money to create or perpetuate or exacerbate barriers against people with disabilities. You want our money, we want to make sure you're not misusing it. Now, the government's done some in this area, but we don't have any sign of, of sort of palpable progress, and they've been quite slow in doing it. The real linchpin, the real point we're going to see if this actually means something or not is next year. 2015, the Toronto uh, 2015 Pan and Para Pan American Games are taking place here. Government's investing a ton of money in it. 
We've asked them to have a, a, a strategy to ensure that this game is not, the games are not only accessible in the sense that people with disabilities can get in the stadium, but that there are accessible restaurants, hotels, tourist sites, services, goods, and employment. So there's a legacy of accessibility. That's happened in other cities that have hosted Olympics. We, so far, don't have a major comprehensive public plan for this. If you check our website, you'll see that we've offered one, uh, but the government is still um, uh, going slow on it. Um, a next area where we've been active is on accessible elections. If people with disabilities are going to have a real clout, they've got to have clout at the ballot box. And there are barriers in the voting process, either getting to uh, a polling station if there's not accessible transit, or accessible parking, getting in the polling station, even though they're supposed to be accessible, they are times not. Elections Ontario messes up, same at the municipal level. And there are people like me who can't mark our ballots on our own and verify our choice. Same with people with certain motor disabilities. Um, we have been pushing for some changes. We fought for legislative reforms. We got halfway measures in 2010. Bill 231 was before the legislature. Details about it on our website. It was a bill to amend the Elections Act, among other things, to deal with accessibility. Our long-term fight is for telephone and internet voting. Secure telephone and internet voting, not only for voters with disabilities, but for everybody. We believe that that will help overcome a lot of barriers, not for all voters with disabilities, but for a lot of them. 44 municipalities in Ontario now use it. Toronto's looking at it. Elections Ontario has been dragging their feet like you cannot believe. Um, the other area I'm going to just talk about for a few seconds is this, the courts. The courts themselves, like all other sectors of our society, have too many barriers facing people with disabilities. And those barriers make it hard to go to court and get justice. It may be in accessible buildings not a uh, lack of available sign language or other communication supports, uh, a wide range of barriers. It's hard to deal with that under an accessibility regulation because you can't regulate judges the way you might, uh, what they, how they handle cases the way you might other, other issues. To the credit of our former Chief Justice Roy McMurtry, after whom my fellowship is named, in 2005, he announced that the court should do their share to fix this. This resulted in a report from a Joint Committee of the Bench, Bar, and Government, chaired by uh, Madam Justice Karen Weiler of our Court of Appeal, I worked on that committee, released in 2007 and on the Court of Appeal website, mapping out how to make our courts more ac uh, fully accessible by 2025. I'm also involved with a joint permanent committee that's overseeing progress uh, to achieve that goal. As I've said in so many other contexts, we're making progress, but we're not on schedule. Let me, uh, let me conclude. The, uh, the, uh, the task we set out on back in 20 years ago, November of 1994, when a small group of us started fighting for this legislation, was undoubtedly an enormous, if not perhaps an unrealistic one. And you would think that everything I've just said today which should make me uh, lack any optimism. After all, if a government that was committed to do this has been dragging their feet on enforcement, taking too long to get these standards made, balking at our efforts to try to get them to direct the next accessibility standards to make, and passing accessibility standards that palpably fall below the human rights code's requirements, you'd think, I should be a pessimist. But I'm not. I'm an optimist. And I'm an optimist for uh, two reasons. The first I already gave you, which is that we have made significant progress but the, uh, so far even though nowhere near what we should have. But the other reason I'm optimistic is because at every step of the way, starting on day one, what we were trying to accomplish looked not only uphill, but inaccessibly uphill. We got the legislation passed, it only took 10 years. We got standards enacted under it, not enough. We got enforcement tools um, pa uh, created, not being used. But we've been able to now secure more public attention than ever before on this with election commitments on accessibility being made at least by two, if not three parties, in every election and many by-elections since 1995. So I remain an optimist that we will get there and we will hold their feet to the fire till we do. I thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to you and I really look forward to taking your questions.